Welcome to the Beverly Hills Plastic Surgery Podcast. I'm Dr. Millicent Rovello, and I am here today with my amazing and ageless co-host, Dr. Jay Calvert. How are you? I am ageless. I am right? not aging. That's the way that I see it. That's the way I see it. That's how it should be. I mean, we are plastic surgeons. That's Why right. should we age? A, you know, aging is optional. <laughs> I agree. So I opt out. Yeah, and that's what we're going to talk about today is age as it relates to plastic surgery. As it relates to plastic surgery. And so specifically, what are the medical risks associated with having plastic surgery as one gets older? And then also, what are the challenges that we as the plastic surgeons face in creating aesthetically pleasing looks for the older patient? Yeah, I mean, and age really is sort of optional. I mean, a, a 50-year-old today voila, is very different than the 50-year-old that I saw as a 10-year-old kid. Absolutely. They're really different. Totally different. That whole thing like, oh, you're over the hill when you're 40. Like, I'm sorry, no, that's not a thing no. anymore. Can we like move past that? And that whole, you know, like little silly saying, age is just a number. Well, it kind of is just a number, especially if you have been doing a good job of taking care of yourself over the years. And certainly I have patients that are in their 50s that are in amazing shape. They're running, they're triathletes, they swim, oh, they've been taking good care of themselves. And for them, age really is just a number. And then I can have some patients that are 35, 40, diabetic, overweight, smokers. And for them, they might as well be 60. So in that regard, Yes, age could be just a number, but really it comes down to how healthy an individual you are. And this is in regards to how well you will tolerate general anesthesia and surgery. For sure. And it also uh, relates to the uh, response of the, the, the body, the organism, the human that is being surgerized, that is yes. being oper operated upon. Because... You know, operating on a, excuse me, uh, Sean, you'll have to cut that. <laughs> operating on a 17-year-old nose is very different than operating on a 50-year-old nose. Right. The tissues have changed over very time. Very much so. Very much so. So let's just do sort of a basic medical thing about surgery in general. We kind of touched on this when we did our obesity and plastic surgery talk, but there are some medical concerns that arise as a patient gets older. We all know that with increasing age comes increased risks of heart attacks, stroke, vascular problems, hypertension, all things that could have potentially worse outcomes with general anesthesia. And for that reason, I have sort of a pretty you know, standard protocol of what I do. Anyone over 40, 45 gets an EKG. Everybody gets a medical clearance. We all get labs. And I sort of put it back on their primary care or their cardiologist to tell me that this patient is medically optimized or is at a low risk or moderate risk for the surgery that they're going to have. And once I sort of get that A-OK, -okay, from their primary doctors, then I'm comfortable proceeding with surgery. That being said, there is no guarantees, there is always risks the older you get with some of these systemic complications, but thankfully they are very, very rare, at least with the kind of surgeries that we do. Well, and on the patients that we operate on, I mean, you have to remember the anesthesia uh, classes of, you know, the, the outpatient setting. We are not taking ASA, you know, anesthesia uh, risk categories three and four, we're, we're doing the ones and the twos, which means that they are essentially low risk for general anesthesia. Low risk for anesthesia, although I will say I probably do the threes in my hospital setting because I do oh, have yeah, you do. older <laughs> patients who have had bariatric surgery and still want some abdominal contouring. And thank God I'm doing them in a hospital setting because that is where I feel more comfortable doing them. But I do have 67, 72 year old patients coming in for tummy tucks and they've had a you know, 100 pound weight loss and they've had a history of diabetes, they've had a history of blood pressure. So I do have experience doing less than optimal candidates for plastic surgery, but I do them in a hospital setting. And generally, overall, from the systemic 
situation, they do okay because they have been cleared as okay for surgery. But what I have noticed in my older patients is that it just takes a little bit longer to recover from anesthesia, from surgery in general. These are patients where their blood pressure may fluctuate a little bit more afterwards. When they stand up, they might get dizzy, a little bit higher risk of falls. Sometimes there's a little bit more of a brain fog that lasts for another day or two after anesthesia. It just takes longer for their mind and their body to bounce back. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing is you're going to see uh, the the difference in abdominoplasty on a 32-year-old uh, woman who's had finished having babies and is ready to get her mommy makeover versus the, the 62-year-old massive weight loss patient are two totally, totally different, different. They're, <laughs> totally they're not even different. <laughs> not, not at all for so many reasons. But the take-home message is that it can be done uh, there will be some differences and that is our job to look at the individual patients and decide if they are safe and appropriate for surgery and then even after surgery maybe just monitor patients a little bit differently if they have any of these risk factors for being you know a little bit longer or slower to recover so let's say we're talking about that 62 year old massive weight loss patient who wants the abdominoplasty do you order a stress test or do you leave that to their clearing physician? I leave to that it? to their clearing physician. I am not a cardiologist. I am not a trained expert in it. I do not deem to step on toes. So if they have a heart history, um, they usually have a cardiologist already. Right. If that's the case, then I do specifically request cardiology clearance in addition to their primary medical clearance. Um, and then I leave it up to the cardiologist to do whatever tests they feel necessary to medically optimize or stratify that patient. And just to sort of clarify, you know, we use the word medical clearance pretty loosely, but medical doctors and cardiologists don't technically clear patients for surgery. What they do is they look at patients' risk for surgery, and that's based on their age, their weight, their history of hypertension, diabetes, have they had a previous heart attack, have they had a stroke, what kind of surgery are they having? And then they do what they call risk stratification. And so we'll get the notes back from their doctors that say, you know, my 22 year old having a breast dog, low risk for a low risk surgery. Right. My 65 year old patient with a history of diabetes, history of maybe remote heart attack that's now lost 100 pounds, they will say moderate risk for a moderate surgery. So that just gives everyone an idea that there is a little bit of increased risk, right. but they are comfortable letting them go to surgery without doing any additional interventions like a cardiac cath or a stent or anything like that. Yeah, and that's really key because you want, you know, we always have patients you know, sign consent forms, they say, what are the risks of the surgery? And we tend to go over the risks of the operation itself, mm -hmm. but there are Bleeding, risks infection, of infection, blah, blah, blah. Right, yeah. yeah. You could need, you know, scars that are unsightly, right. et cetera. Those are sort of risks of having these specific operations, but the risk of general anesthesia alone with doing nothing, there are risks. If we just took you to the operating yeah. room. And did nothing. Induced just anesthesia. Anesthesia. <laughs> and put you to sleep and woke you up. Yeah. Uh, you do it enough times, there can be a problem. There, and that is, I mean, that is a very real risk of having general anesthesia. So it can be done safely. Um, and there certainly are measures that we take to make sure that it is done as safely as possible. Um, but yes, there are always risks. And when I get that question from my 67 year old patient, am I a good candidate for an abdominoplasty? Yes, but. You know, yeah. this is gonna be a different recovery and there are different medical considerations for you than for someone who's younger. And particularly, the type of surgery as well makes a difference. Because a 67-year-old having a facelift for four hours or a 67-year-old having a total body abdominoplasty and liposuction surgery for five or six hours, totally different risk factors. Because now we're talking about fluid shifts, fluid coming in, fluid coming out, how that affects the heart, how it affects their blood pressure. Facelift, after the surgery, after the anesthesia is out of your system, there's not really a whole lot of fluid shifts happening, strain on the no. heart, things like that. No, a facelift is a, it's a, you know, face, skin, and subcutaneous tissue operation. Right. It's not like you're getting into uh, areas that are going to affect the internal organs. Because when you do that abdominal plication, it changes things. It changes, it changes things. the game. 
yeah. and that that can affect your overall physiology it can affect the you know just the way that your body works i mean it can affect venous return from the legs to the heart like all those things and what that it just basically means is that it has you know higher impact on your body that you your body must right. accommodate like for and heal in a systemic way it affects your body correct yeah. a facelift is pretty benign yeah that one's usually pretty well tolerated same with a nose job rhinoplasties yeah. are pretty well tolerated the only time that i see a lot of swelling and and a big hit from a rhinoplasty is when i have to do a really major septal reconstruction mm. and you're in on the skull base and it, it is yeah it's a little you get a little bit more <laughs> you get a little more swelling a little bit more bleeding and and it can be a bigger hit when you're just kind of doing a you know make my nose pretty rhinoplasty it's it, it's not as high impact right and so th those are the medical considerations when we're talking about older patients but then there are just the aesthetic considerations that happen with older patients that are way different than the younger 25 year olds coming in for a breast dog and usually it relates to the quality of the tissues right. so even if you are a patient that has been really good about sun exposure and you've been using your retin-a and you've stayed out of the sun you've been a good girl you still have the effects of aging on your skin some, some worse than others but it's still there and like you were saying with the noses you know, the tissues are just more brittle, the cartilages. Well, and the big reason for that is as we get older, our collagen chains get shorter. This is like the actual physiology of why aging really starts to, to show up. And Which just is why for, every anti-aging product out there says, builds collagen. That's right. It builds collagen. <laughs> sure it does. Uh -huh. <laughs> when you can get my genetics to <laughs> pump out some more collagen, it's going to make the difference. So what happens, the collagen is a protein that makes up skin and soft tissues. And, and it's, a, it's an important building block protein. So if you have big, long chains of collagen, they take on more water. They're plumper. They, they, make, they make things look better. And when they get shorter, they start to clump up yeah, and get, get a little more dis and, yeah. disorganized. And so, so like that's where, and, and you and I were talking about like a breast augmentation in the 18 year old versus the 72 year old, which I've done. Mm -hmm. um, it can be done, but it's hard. It is hard. Breast implants in older patients are really, really hard because you are fighting two separate battles here. You know, the, on table, the immediate problem is that there's just a lot of extra skin. And yes, we can remove skin with mastopexies, but the skin that's left behind is not great quality skin. It's lost its um, ability to kind of snap back and, and stay tight. And so it's not going to form and shape itself around that implant no. to the extent that you want it to. It's going to no, be kind not. of like a ball and kind of an empty bag kind of situation, no matter how much or how tight we pull that skin around it. And then over time, that implant is going to fall because the skin trying to hold it up is not great quality. So it's going to relax and it's going to loosen. And pretty soon that implant that started out you know, in a good position within like six months has now fallen and still a lot better maybe than before but it's not going to be high and perky like it was and that's the tissue of the breast and then there's the tissue around the breast so the skin of the side of the chest wall oh yeah oh that is my nemesis that <laughs> skin is just even the skinniest of patients the healthiest of patients that extra skin on the side of the breast is sagging and it's loose and it just it drives me nuts. It's like a squirrel suit. <laughs> and there's nothing you can do about it short of cutting it out, which is not really a great option for, for most nope. people. So you, as long as you know that that's going to be there and it may or may not detract from the appearance of the implants, you just got to know that that's part of the deal. Yep. That bra fat armpit side of the chest wall. Yeah. Squirrel suit skin. It's terrible. It really wrecks the, the it, look. It really does. And it's just... You know, you, you think of breast implants and you want to, you think of these like really pretty and perky breasts, but it's just not that when you have older aging skin. And not to say that we can't make a nice looking breast with implants. You just have to adjust your expectations. You are not going to have the pretty 25 year old breast implants. That's usually what I tell people to do before listening to our podcast. What's to that? Adjust their expectations. Adjust their expectations. <laughs> 
<laughs> you won't Adjust be disappointed yourself. that way. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's true. You have to say, look, this is, see this stuff here? It's going to be there afterwards. Still we're not, we're not going to cut all up on your arms and down the sidewall of your chest. I mean, you can, but that those scars are those not. Are, those are real that's scars. That's a pretty rough trade. And the same thing for liposuction. Like I, after a certain age, I just refuse to do liposuction on patients because I'm like, it's not going to give you what you want. And your skin is going to be so loose afterwards and it's going to show every lump and bump from the liposuction. It's just, I know what you're asking me to do and I know what you want it to look like afterwards. And liposuction alone is just not going to do it for you. No, it's not. No. You got to cut that skin out. At a certain age, it's got to be taken away. It's got to be taken away. Same thing for a Brazilian butt lift. I had that consult today. And a lady that wasn't even, she's not older per se. She was in her 50s. But she has some loose skin of her buttocks. And she was asking if she was a candidate for Brazilian butt lift. And she really didn't have a lot of fat. She was a normal average BMI person. I'm like, you really don't have enough fat to get the look that I know you're, you're talking about. Because any kind of loose skin in the buttocks is going to prohibit that volumized buttock look from the fat like when usually when you see these nice big butts from brazilian butt lift it's young girls with tight skin who have a moderate amount of extra fat to give and you put the fat in the butt and it just blows up and it looks great and it's perky and it's bouncy but if that skin's not tight and it's loose it's like filling an empty bag with just you know it just keeps taking it yeah (laughs) you never see a difference So you got to really consider the quality of the skin on a lot of these procedures and realize that you are not in the category of that cute little model that you saw on that plastic surgeon's website. Nope. Nope. It's okay, though. It's okay. Because we got other options. We have options. We got options. I recently did butt implants in a 65-year-old. That's an option. It's an option. And you know what? Looking good. I bet. I bet. That's sort of where Looking you have good. to go with you that. You do. You put age. the volume in. It's like, yeah. there it is. Or you got to do some cuts and lift some skin or take away skin. So, yes. And she had had a butt lift. That's why she came to the implants because she had had lo- weight loss, had a butt lift, and now like her There's butt nothing like, just goes from like her like spine to her legs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I may I make a lot of those butts with my <laughs> with my lower body lifts, my butt lifts, and the weight loss patients. Because once you lose weight, and then you have extra skin, and you pull the skin up, and you cut it out, there's nothing left nope. to make a butt. There's, there's no butt. nothing. And I'm not a big fan of putting implants in at the same time as that surgery. So I I say the same thing: have your butt lift, get rid of the extra skin. Then when the skin is in a good place, come back and we can put in implants. But yeah. Yeah, and you know, facelifts too. It's the same thing. You know, you, you've got aging skin. Um, there, there's there's upsides and downsides to that. The upside is is that your scars are going to be better. Scars are amazing yeah, in older skin. Like they, they become invisible. <laughs> they are. They're great. But the the downside is that the skin can still be crepey. Right. And you know, three four years after the facelift, you're like, oh, what do I do? And then it's usually put some fat in there. There's right. there there are options, but you have to kind of go on the journey with. With any plastic surgery, any really. Any plastic surgery. Time, age, gravity. They're always going to win. That's why I tell people all the time. Um, and so everyone always asks, well, how long does a facelift last for? Maybe 10 years-ish. But know that it's n- we're not stopping time. Time and gravity are going to continue to work on your new facelift. So you're going to need it touched up. You're going to need it pulled again. These beautiful actresses in their 70s and 80s that look amazing, <clears throat> you know, Jane Fonda, <laughs> they've probably had two, three, four facelifts. I'm not saying she has. I'm not putting that out there. Don't quote no. me. But to keep looking that good, usually you need a little more tuck every couple of years and sure. then tuck a little more and then tuck a little more. And that's just part of the deal if you want to maintain. Absolutely. You cannot... We we have not figured out how to stop time. No, so, not yet. No, We're I, working on that. That that is the truth. But you know. actually, I am working on that. You know why? Because every once in a while, my son will ask me if you could have a superpower, what would it be? And hands down, every time I say, "Oh, I just want to stop time. I just I need a couple extra three hours in my day <laughs> to just you know, zoom around and get stuff done. I just, just I need more time. I need more time." So I am working on that as my superpower. Stopping time. That's a good superpower. Right? Yeah, you get I, so much done. Yeah. I think uh, I think that would be a good one for you. Yeah. You, you're, <laughs> you're definitely an errand runner. And a, uh, you know, and I think that would really help you. You could get your cobbler more often. My cobbler, my tailor, my seamstress, my dry cleaners. <laughs> <laughs> Every weekend. <laughs> That's true. Well, good. Anything else about aging plastic surgery patients since you and I 
are that. Apparently, yes. <laughs> uh, no, just know that uh, definitely an option as long as you are otherwise healthy, relatively healthy, and just know that there are going to be some differences. And you just have to plan it and execute flawlessly. That's always the key. I agree. Well, I think that's about it. So this is the Beverly Hills Plastic Surgery Podcast coming to you from the 90210.